Good afternoon. I'm Pat Living with the Department of Health and Social Services and moderator for the COVID update for Tuesday, May 26th. Today, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Brendan Hanley, will provide a technical briefing on modeling to respond to the many questions we have received around what modeling is, what does it tell us, and how is it done. At the end, we will go to the phone lines for questions from reporters. We will call you by name, and you'll each have one question plus one follow up. Our French speaking journalists are encouraged to ask their questions in French. With us today is Andre Boursier from the French Language Services Directorate to translate those questions for those who do not speak French. Thank you. Dr. Hanley? Thank you. Merci. As mentioned uh, um, by, uh, by Pat, I'm going to give a little bit of a background to, um, to the modeling and to what we are thinking as we are doing the modeling. Uh, ce sera en anglais, uh, donc je, je peux répondre aux questions en français uh, après, uh, mais la présentation sera en anglais. So I'll stick to uh, English only for the technical briefing, but I'll um, do my best to answer questions in French um, after, um, after the presentation. Now, I, I want to just set the context that um, that this is really about the process of models, the types of models, and the purpose of models. Um, and some of the uh, figures I'll be showing are, are examples of what models can tell us. And so it's really more about, about the process rather than the numbers themselves. Uh, any number I show is going to be subject to, uh, is based on a variety of assumptions and is subject to variability. Um, but I think it, it'll help to illustrate um, the, um, the, the, the possibilities um, that, we, uh, that we can um, work with uh, when we're doing modeling. This is uh, simply a graph of the numbers of, of uh, cases, uh, just to set the, the basic context. Um, as, as you all know, we remain with uh, 11 uh, cases. Uh, we have so, so what we have towards the uh, right side of the graph there um, is uh, the green picture, which represents um, all 11 cases recovered. So if we were to project that through the rest of May, it would show just uh, the green bars at that the same uh, the same level so this is one way of portraying totals active cases which uh, here are represented in orange um, and then recovered cases so models are mathematical tools and they help us understand disease progression under various conditions they're not predictions of the future, but they're really best guesses, as I say, based on a number of assumptions. So not every model is appropriate to answer every question at every stage of the outbreak. There are means to estimate and predict what might happen in different scenarios. And they enable us to see, for example, what may have happened if we had not implemented public health measures and border controls at a certain point, and that's one of the areas that um, I'll go into for illustration purposes. In the, in the quotation on the slide, uh, it just uh, uh, emphasizes that models describe a range of possibilities, and ideally these are possibilities sensitive to action. So we can see, well, if we did this, then this might happen. In terms of the, uh, the, the building process, modeling starts with identifying a question, and that question might be um, something like how many hospital beds will, will, will we need in case of an outbreak? And then it's choosing the most appropriate method to answer that uh, using uh, uh, the type of model that's best suited to answer that question. And then it's building that model or adopting a model that's already created by, um, by experts. Um, and in our case, those experts might be in uh, another jurisdiction, especially a larger jurisdiction that has that technical modeling capacity or the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, and then we collect, we collect the data to feed into the model, run the model and analyze the results, and then repeat the process. So we started by building our own models in Yukon, 
relatively simple models. And now uh, we're, we're exploring the possibility of using more complex models developed by national organizations and other jurisdictions. Modeling is never finished, as you'll see, even from when we previously gave uh, results based on one type of model, we now have slightly more refined results based on a more sophisticated model. We run many different scenarios and we're continually trying to improve the, the model and improve the inputs and improve the outputs. I'm going to talk, that although there are several types of models, I'm going to talk about two principal uh, models that are most re relevant to us. And those are called compartmental models and agent-based models. Compartmental models are uh, simple models and, and they really address population level uh, questions. They represent the population in various compartments, and I'll give an example of that. And they rely on uh, an exponential growth rate of an epidemic. So that growth rate is defined. We, we, we define it by using different variables. Um, and the, these models uh, are most suitable and, and best applied in areas with community transmission. And that's the type of model that you will have seen applied in uh, yeah, in some of the provinces when they presented their um, modeling data, uh, especially those where they have had evidence of community spread. The other, the other type of model is called agent-based model. These are much more complex models. They need a lot more computational power. They're, they're, they're much more difficult uh, and complex to develop and to validate. Um, and they, they are based rather than on a population per se, they're really based on an individual level that then uh, starts at the bottom and builds up to, to then predict population effects based on individual behaviors. So really what goes into that type of model is uh, the be individual behavior plus interactions of individuals within a population. And, and really what we try to get out in that model is how small changes in behavior and interactions may influence disease transmission. So uh, the first type of model then that I, I talked about is the compartmental uh, example. And in this model called the SEIR uh, model that, that has four components, four compartments, and the S stands for susceptible, so who is susceptible to infection, um, exposed, the number of people exposed within that population, the number who actually become infected, and then the number who are uh, recovered. So this model, uh, as I said, it depends on an assumption that that disease is already spreading in the community. And this model uses data from other countries and from Canada and from Yukon to model how the spread would look of COVID in Yukon. It assumes a well-mixed population. It assumes individuals are equally likely to encounter each other. And it assumes that everyone stays in, in their own compartment, whether mild disease, severe disease, or critical case status, based on assigned percentages. It also assumes that individuals do not isolate and remain infectious for an entire period of uh, a seven-day period. It also assumes that people who have recovered are now immune and don't become reinfected. So if we look at a number of uh, different scenarios, and, and this goes back to some of the, uh, again, some of the estimates that we had previously uh, talked about. So this gives more of the technical background. And as I say, the, the model which we're using now will have, will have different numbers because it's a slightly more sophisticated model uh, with, with new numbers that I'll, I'll, I'll show you. So you've probably heard of the R0 value or the R0. And, w and in this, what, what this diagram shows is that one person, in average, if there are no public health measures, uh, based on average estimates of COVID transmission, one person is, um, is able to 
on average, transmit infection to an average of two and a half or 2.4 other, other people. So again, that assumes no case identification, just free flowing within the population, no contact tracing, no quarantine, no self-isolation from out of territory. Um, so here you you see uh, then if uh, if if a case were introduced at day uh, at day one, as you see on the left of the graph, the blue shows the number of accumulated cases that would have occurred after um, a period of 66 days, and and that 66 again arbitrary number, but it was originally the the number chosen when we were looking at initial infection in mid March. How would that look in mid May, um, or approximately two months later? So that would show us an accumulated uh, number of cases of uh, 2,000, uh, uh, almost 2,000 cases, of which uh, on, uh, on a particular day, at day 66, there would be 639 active cases. That would be documented. So, uh, so that, that means um, number of confirmed laboratory tested cases. So that, that um, in turn, uh, could mean as many as 77 cases by that day requiring hospitalization and 23 cases requiring intensive care. So uh, uh, clearly, clearly enough to uh, to be more than what our health care system could uh, sustain, even if we were to. Uh, downplay some of those uh, estimates of uh, proportion uh, proportion requiring uh, hospitalization proportion requiring ICU you could you can see that there would be tremendous pressure on the healthcare system so previous our previous um, model uh, where we talked about that 7,000 number of active cases um, is now slightly down, down revised to about 6,400. Uh, again, uh, small differences in numbers. The 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 overall effect is um, is the same, um, but you see that the peak is also different. So we. Um, uh, on the on the left side, you show the the, the kind of the old peak with the um, the older model that we used compared to the new peak. Um, again, running into uh, many thousands of potential active cases uh, based on one introduction with no public health measures. Now the old uh, model here is the SIR um, had different assumptions, um, and it what it assumed was that a person exposed to COVID became immediately infectious, whereas we know that it actually takes uh, several days. Um, so, so the addition of the E in the formula um, stands for exposed, has that factor of a lag time between uh, the, the time between when a person is exposed and when they become infectious to others. Now, in the uh, second uh, a second scenario, uh, this would be if uh, a case similarly were introduced, um, and uh, we have during two weeks we have that ability of the of the uh, person to circulate and infect others, and those people would infect others. Uh, again, at that 2.4 um, uh, rate, one person infecting an average of two and a half others. And then after two weeks, public health measures were implemented. And that would mean case isolation, case identification, isolation, contact tracing, uh, followed by physical distancing. We would expect a lag time of about another 14 days before, uh, before we could get that down, that R0 down to, uh, to a ratio where uh, where it's less than one, so that one person is able to uh, infect less than one other person. Um, and uh, uh, so then the, the, the effect, as, it, as expected, would be much different. So in this case, uh, the, the, the number of cumulative cases would be substantially lower, um, 67 cases over the same period of time. Um, with up to four cases on any one any one time, so you can see that even uh, it, 
even if we had a, a lag time between introduction and implementation of public health measures, it, uh, it, it still would have had a profound effect on reducing uh, by about a hundredfold the number of um, infections. In the third scenario, then we, uh, we have a, um, a case where it's likely what is most uh, represented in, in the Yukon case, and this is the, the best scenario in cases in, in terms of disease transmission. And here, um, here the, the diagram shows one person affecting, um, uh, uh, affecting only about half another person, so already less than one person per person infected. So less than one, if the R0 or that infectivity is less than one to one, then we know that we're in control of, of the epidemic. It, um, so this is built on the assumption of uh, 0.62 more people infected for every person infected. In this uh, scenario, the public health measures are high physical distancing, high case identification and isolation, high contact tracing and quarantine, and high self-isolation by out-of-province travelers. The, uh, so, so, that, so that really shows that um, w we would be in, in the situation which we are now, the containment, the, the, the case, case containment, which is, uh, again, where we want to stay. It also shows that between uh, scenario two, so again, back to the scenario two, um, where there are COVID cases, um, but uh, substantially, substantially lower compared to the unrestrained, and the scenario one where we really got ahead, um, there's going to be some uh, ability uh, potentially to adjust your risk or your risk tolerance um, based on um, the best perhaps balance and balance of risks. So ideally, uh, we would be able to model uh, what is the what is the what can we tolerate in terms of COVID uh, transmission at the cost of this amount of restriction and, and start to play with how much restriction can you get away with. Um, uh, to to maintain reasonable control uh, and prevent um, and, and prevent serious uh, outcomes associated with your with your COVID. So that really comes to the the role of of the the more sophisticated models, um, and and these are models that don't rely on the premise of community spread. So these these are really. Uh, uh, needed to to better model potential potential epidemics. Given we managed to control our first epidemic uh, without uh, without community transmission, so we're really looking for for models that are more realistic uh, to our what our actual situation is. So we're partnering with the Public Health Agency of Canada to run various models with different degrees of public health measure relaxation. So thus, what, one of the areas uh, that we're interested in is um, being able to more systematically assess the risk of importing new cases from outside Yukon. So, so that means if, uh, for instance, uh, in the rest of Canada, uh, the prevalence of, of COVID is at a certain number, um, and if we have an estimate of how many people are coming into Yukon and from what parts of the country or at what rates, um, then what what would that mean for um, importation and then the potential for COVID spread within within Yukon? And that's where we, uh, we, ex we can start to explore models that are based on individual behavior, which really should be closer to Yukon's current reality. And that's, and that's the role of the so-called agent-based uh, modeling. So that's, that's a work in progress. We don't, uh, we don't have results from agent-based modeling. That, that uh, again, is a collaboration with Public Health Agency of Canada, like many other jurisdictions are uh, relying on the, on the um, computing power and the expertise at Public Health Agency of Canada to help us with these more sophisticated modelings. 
So we can, we, it's quite clear, um, even without modeling, of course, but the, the modeling helps to, the, the simple models that we've developed so far allow us to show, uh, again, to give us some estimate of what could have happened um, without any public health measures. Um, it, uh, um, what, what I think modeling can do from, from here on, as, as we get better at doing this, uh, as we build our own expertise, as we build the um, uh, collaboration with public health agency, and as they in turn start to um, uh, uh, build, um, build models uh, based on what we know about COVID and COVID transmission, then we can get to a better place. I hope to be able to use modeling to help us balance COVID prevention with prevention of unintended consequences. Uh, clearly though, uh, clearly though public health measures, including the safe six, are going to be important uh, in, in, uh, in, in the weeks and, and the months to come. Um, we know they're effective, we've, we've shown they're effective, the modeling data shows us the, uh, the effectiveness of public health measures. And, uh, and, and that's the way we need to continue. In an ideal world, uh, again, we would be able to separate those measures and, and to know the relative contributions of each. Um, and again, that's, that's beyond the power of these basic models that we've been using so far. So it really gives us the overall package result without giving us the uh, individual contribution of each particular measure, which of course would be, would be of interest. So that's the short summary of, um, of the modeling and, and the type of thinking that we're putting into models, uh, a bit of a snapshot of the progress uh, to date and uh, where we hope to go uh, with agent-based modeling in collaboration with public health agency. I hope in weeks to come to be able to bring more, more information and more, um, I guess, mathematical information to help us in, uh, in the weeks to come as we contemplate our, uh, our ongoing reopening strategies. Uh, we also are going to be looking at things like what happens with uh, what happens if there's a resurgence of COVID in Canada, the second wave, and how would that affect our um, importation risk? Um, how will, um, uh, again, varying prevalence of COVID within Canada and very varying border measures, how, how, how can we play with those variables to have a better estimate of what, uh, what the risk would be by different measures of COVID uh, circulating? And then what could, we, what could we best be able to, to tolerate and to handle in terms of risk? So I, I hope that gives you, gives you a better sort of technical background to the, to the modeling data and I'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. We'll go first to Tim from CKRW. Hi, good afternoon, Dr. Hanley. Uh, you had mentioned that this was the model from mid-March to mid-May. What models are we looking at now? How far are you looking ahead in the modeling that uh, I assume is going on right now? So it's it's not so much of a time span as looking at different variables and different possibilities. So um, um, the and and that goes back to the the purpose of the agent-based modeling. It really looks at everything in a completely different way. Um, and so in terms of um, uh, again, uh, if if we had uh, this prevalence in Canada. Um, what would the importation risk? It's almost like we're changing the questions because I think we've looked enough at what could have happened if we didn't do anything. I think we've we sort of answered that question. We're really looking to the future, which is based on uh, so much. So much of what we've done has been uh, and accomplished has been around closing the borders and reducing our importation risk as close to zero as we can manage. And and now we really want to say, well, how how is that risk changing? Uh, when importation risk is um, when importation risk changes, uh, then how much can we tolerate, for instance, uh, loosening some of our border restrictions? And though, so it's not so much of looking at a time span; it's looking at the what would the result be, um, and that might be a result over the weeks to come. Next question, Tim. I'm just wondering, uh, uh, with personal services businesses uh, getting set to open, well, I guess tomorrow, restaurants on Friday, uh, I guess 
How are you feeling about this, considering where we are at in the territory, and um, how and uh, yeah, how many um, applications have you approved? Well, um, I I can't tell you how many applications. I I know we've had lots coming in. I I know um, in terms of the personal uh, care services, um, I I believe the last time I looked, well over thirty. And I I can't tell you how many restaurant applications, um, but I can get back to you on that. Um, the, you know, we're doing everything in a pretty secure state right now uh, because our, our borders, we remain uh, with uh, closed borders except to essential visits and those, those clearly outlined purposes and um, along with the self-isolation period. So really what I'm talking about is a phase three thinking. So. So how, how confident can we be um, about uh, loosening our borders and knowing as best as we can the, uh, the, best, the, best, uh, the best estimates of scenarios associated um, with, with um, border loosenings? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move now to Jane at CBC. Hi, Dr. Hanley. Um, Scenario three, um, it says uh, Yukon, uh, uh, like it has the uh, implementation of public health, health measures before the first case, which uh, seems to be what we have done. But why have why are there no other like future projections associated with scenario three, like there are with the other two scenarios, like no future projection of how many cases there could be in, in Yukon uh, as we continue along? Uh, why is that not included? Yeah, that's a really good question, and and that's because and maybe I didn't make that clear enough. And and it's really because we've been applying these models that are based on community spread. So you could only really make future projections based on that model if you had ongoing community spread. Whereas we have um, we have uh, cases that are contained, and so. Really, if we think of, for instance, one case coming in tomorrow or next week or in the next couple of weeks, but we we continue to have these measures in place, we remain in, in that scenario three positions because we remain on top of the epidemic having having measures in place that that keep the ability of one person to spread to another at less than one. So as long as we're at less than one, uh, we're in containment phase and that means we extinguish uh, we can extinguish the uh, epidemic. So, as we as we're looking ahead, we're really looking at uh, again d different questions, basically, rather than pro projections of increasing cases, uh, because we don't. Uh, it goes back to that concept of we don't really have a have a, a curve to work with here. So we're really starting to work with different questions. Next question, Jane. My other question is around um, mask use as, you know, more businesses are opening and, uh, you know, the weather's nice and people are out doing things. I feel like I ask <laughs> about this a lot about how do people kind of kind of keep maintaining um, physical distancing and following those public health measures. There's been some questions recently around mask use. Um, should people be wearing masks in Yukon? And if so, when should they be wearing them? Yeah, so, uh, and that reflects some of the, uh, as you know, some of the recent uh, advice from the Chief Public Health Officer um, of Canada um, and, and the recommendations uh, through the Public Health Agency, uh, which recommend use of non-medical masks in situations where uh, physical measures um, cannot be maintained. So when when that that space is um, um, is not able, that spacing of two meters is not able to be observed. So, uh, but there's also uh, you'll notice that there's language there um, c quite clearly that 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 recommendation will vary by whether there is, uh, uh, but, but by the by really by the epidemiology by how much COVID is in the community. 
So in a community like ours, like in Yukon, where we do not have any evidence of uh, community circulation of, of COVID, um, then we have a, an, an exceedingly low um, uh, prevalence of COVID uh, in the territory and no documented prevalence at all, in fact. Um, th and we are also in a situation where it's physical spacing is uh, except for some very, very isolated circumstances, uh, re really quite easy to maintain. So, uh, so this is not a recommendation that that I'm making based on our epidemiology in our territory that we need. Now we have added uh, the particular circumstances in the, in our personal care advice. We have because to do um, to do some of those personal care services like like a haircut or nails, um, it really does in, entail um, um, broaching that two meter space and very close contact. But these are at the same time non medical settings. So as an extra as an extra precaution, uh, we advise the use of non medical masks in in those cases. But for public use, uh, I have not made that uh, that recommendation. It doesn't mean someone is wrong uh, to use a mask uh, if they if they feel better uh, wearing a mask. Um, but I'm confident, based on our degree of transmission and uh, our uh, the, and the absence of COVID circulation in our community, that that the, the the attention really is best placed on observing physical distancing and the other safe six measures. Thank you. We'll move to Gord, Yukon News. No questions. Thank you. Gabrielle, White Horse Star. Good afternoon. I'm wondering how long have you had these models available? How long have you had these numbers for? Way back when we were starting to put public health measures in, did we know that one case could end up being X number of cases that we see here? <laughs> Yeah, good question again. And, and uh, we didn't know we the the, the modeling actually, um, although at the moment the models the, the the models that I've been talking about the uh, the compartmental model or the more simple model is one that is now developed locally and you can if you plug in different numbers you can get an answer in five minutes. But it took uh, many weeks, um, really four to six weeks of development to get to that point where you can plug in those numbers plug in numbers and get those answers. So a lot goes into model development and to really figuring out how to do it, uh, figuring out the right numbers to put in, learning more about COVID transmission. So it's uh, so these are um, and this this particular model that what I call that sort of phase two model the SEIR model which has the additional exposed is really a product of the last couple of weeks that we've had that that more sophisticated version of the first type of model uh, so yeah really quite uh, quite recent information so we made the, the the original decision based really on on expertise on evidence that we had accumulated, on working with other jurisdictions, on looking at uh, what international, you know, what had been done in China and internationally, and uh, made the best decision on the best evidence that we had at the time. Follow-up question, Gabrielle? Yeah, um, I'm wondering, so now that we're looking at these numbers, what is the value in looking back at what could have happened and didn't? For me, the best value is that public health measures matter. And no matter what we do, um, until we get to a point where we are confident that we have no more risk of COVID introduction into the territory, um, we, have to, we have to rely on the package of public health measures. <clears throat> and that includes the, the, the public part, the public contribution part, which is those six steps to st staying safe, the physical distancing. And it includes the, uh, the public health capacity part of being able to maintain our capacity to be able to do the case identification, the contact tracing, and to be able to then um, um, ramp up that capacity if required. So it, it, it really gives us the, I think, it reaffirms the need to emphasize 
that whatever we do from here on, the public health measures are critical in maintaining um, the ability to, uh, to do this safely. Thank you. Claudiane, Radio-Canada. Oui, euh, docteur Henry, c'est possible de me dire, donc, euh, vous allez vous répéter, là, évidemment, mais en quelque sorte, quelle est la grande conclusion à laquelle vous arrivez en regardant ces différents modèles, là? Dr. Henley, can you tell us uh, what is the uh, great conclusion you come to, or the most important one, uh, when you look at this modeling and what it uh, gives you as information? Merci. En, euh, oui, ce serait bien peut-être euh, de tout répéter euh, si on avait le temps. Mais en général, c'est que euh, on a démontré qu'avec le premier modèle, euh, que les mesures de santé publique sont, sont, sont essentielles. Pour, um, pour, pour nous entretenir, pour, um, pour um, prévenir uh, ou empêcher la, la menace de COVID. Donc, donc uh, c'est fondamental de rester sur les mesures uh, de santé publique. La deuxième, c'est que les questions d'ici et en, en avant pour le futur restent sur des, de poser des différentes questions, des questions différentes. Et c'est des questions de, de risque d'importation. Donc, mais, mais pour ça, il faut des modèles beaucoup plus complexes. Il faut une collaboration qui est, on, on, on est en train de collaborer avec l'Agence la, santé publique du Canada pour développer des modèles plus complexes pour, pour répondre aux questions plus sophistiquées que si on change les mesures sur les frontières, par exemple, comment ça change la risque d'importation des, des potentiels des cas. Et donc, d'ici pour les semaines qui viennent, on attend les résultats pour nous aider à, à, à faire des décisions sur les, sur les frontières. Prochaine question, Claudiane. Merci. Pouvez-vous me donner donc un peu plus d'exemples concrets sur ce type de question? Vous mentionnez donc les frontières. On sait que la frontière est déjà ouverte, ou en tout cas en partie, pour permettre le trafic vers l'Alaska. Quels sont les premiers, les premiers aspects là, pour lesquels vous voulez avoir des réponses en utilisant ces modèles? Est-ce que ce sont les arrivées par l'aéroport? Est-ce que, est que ce sont l'ouverture de d'autres d'autres entreprises, d'autres commerces, quels sont les aspects que vous envisagez en premier? So, the question is about uh, what are the most important cases you have in mind and how it can influence the modeling you have? What are the most important things that might happen in the coming weeks that would change uh, what we see right now in your modeling? Donc, um c'est euh, selon la prévalence de COVID dans les, euh, dans les, dans, dans les, euh, dans les juridictions euh, à côté euh, ou dans le, dans le Canada en général, euh, mais aussi la, la circulation de COVID dans les, euh, dans les provinces euh, à côté de nous, comme Colombie-Britannique, Alberta, et, euh, en Alaska, et de, dans, les, dans les pays euh, où on a les des relations directes avec. Donc, euh, donc peut-être le, le, on a un intérêt pour, pour, les, pour, les, pour, les, pour les modèles. On est très intéressé par, par les taux de, de prévalence euh, dans, dans ces, autres, euh, ces, ces autres régions. Et, et non, non seulement maintenant, mais euh, par exemple, pendant la s'il y a une deuxième vague, si dans la saison de, de, de la grippe, si ça remonte euh, et qu'est-ce que ça, ça pose comme risque. Et ça, c'est joué avec euh, si on avait telle personne qui entre et tel nombre de personnes euh, euh, qui traversent les frontières, comment on peut jouer ça contre la, la prévalence de COVID dans certaines régions. Donc, c'est cette sorte de questions qu'on va, j'espère, avoir plus d'informations des modèles. 
Merci, Claudiane. Julien, un robot réel? Oui, en fait, euh, je me demandais c'était quoi la marge d'erreur pour ces types de modèles. So, what is the uh, margin of error that you can have with these models? Uh, C'est une bonne question uh, et, et ça dépend, uh, par exemple, on, uh, on peut peut-être mettre en question chaque variable. Uh, par exemple, um, qu qu'est-ce um, um, qu que la transmission de COVID et qu'est-ce que c'est les, les, les meilleures évidences pour la transmission. Euh, donc, on, on a choisi 2,4 deux, deux, deux comme l'index de transmission. On peut aussi jouer avec euh, le nombre d'hospitalisations basées sur le nombre de cas confirmés et ça peut changer avec plus d'informations. Donc, mais en général, je pense que ça va rester dans le même ordre, même si ça change par... On, 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 je, je devine hier par 10, euh, 20, 30 c'est pour, pour avoir l'ordre en général euh, des nombres. Prochaine question, Julien? Non, pas d'autres questions, merci. Merci. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. It appears that that's all for today. Um, thank you, everyone, for your time today. The briefing for Friday, May 29th, will also take a different format. Premier Sandy Silver and Dr. Hanley will respond to questions from the general public. If you have a question you would like to submit, please send it to covid19info at gov.yk.ca with the subject line virtual town hall. That's covid19info at gov.yk.ca with the subject line virtual town hall. Thank you. <laughs>